Aloha, you're watching Islamba today for Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rifa Hassan. Today's topic is what's next for Imran Khan. And we're talking about Imran Khan, former prime minister, and in many ways, the most popular politician in the country, despite whatever happened on May the 9th, where um, you, know, you could say that sedition charges were actually laid on him and that he could be trialed under a military court as well. I have with me journalist, Mr. Amir Zia. He has a keen eye on these developments and he's gonna share insights on what would be next for the former prime minister and his party as he looks to navigate this difficult political situation that he finds himself in. So Mr. Amir Zia, thank you so much for joining me on the show. You're most welcome and thank you very much for inviting me on your show. Thank you, Mr. Armour. So let's start with the basic question here, uh, which is, the, uh, of course, the theme of this episode. What's next for Imran Khan as he looks to navigate this difficult political landscape? Hamza, if you allow me, I'm not trying to deflect your question, but okay. I would say that uh, what's in store for Pakistan? Imran okay. Khan is one of the players uh, within our country. Uh, and uh, the future of the country is now is in question uh, because everybody's unsure. Uh, that uh, whether elections will be held on time or not, uh, what is in the store for, for Pakistan on the e economic front, and uh, among the major political players, I mean, what, what is in what is in the store for the PDM? And when we break down the PDM, what is in, is is in the store for PMLN or for People's Party? And yes, Imran Khan is one of the uh, one of the players, major players. So I would say that uh, everybody, if you start talking to some, I mean, to the business people in Pakistan or analysts. They say the times are tough for the country. Right. And the times are tough on two accounts. One, the economy is in shambles. And it, it's a huge challenge for us. So, so I would say that, I mean, economy, economic challenge is a big challenge for us. And at the same time, political instability is the second challenge for us. And both these challenges are feeding one another. So political uncertainty and all the instability it is feeding, it is wrecking our economy. And because of the bad economic situation, our politics is going, you know, haywire. So this is the overall situation, which is very grim, very challenging for the state for the government, and for all the political players. And among all those political players, there's one major player, that is Imran Khan. So another question arises, I mean, whenever the next elections are held, I mean, uh, uh, number one, that we should not be doubting that election, should, whether the elections will be held on time or not. But still in Pakistan, I mean, as you are based here now, uh, so you can see that, I mean, many people are asking this question. So when will be the elections? Uh, under the constitution, they should be sometime uh, by November this year. Yeah. So if the elections are held, by November, then there's another question, will all the political players be allowed to participate in, in, in those elections in a free and fair manner? Will those elections will be free and fair? And uh, connected to it is the fate of PTI and Imran Khan, uh, that uh, whether they'll be allowed to run in the elections or not. So these are the, some of the basic questions. And uh, Imran Khan, of course, as the country faces a tough time, Imran Khan is also facing one of the toughest times of his career. Betting under pressure, playing uh, cricket under pressure is one thing, and doing politics in a third world developing country under pressure is totally a different thing. Yes, Hamza. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so when we talk about the PTI in general, now we've seen the party's powers being clipped. Most of the senior leadership has gone to defecting factions, and obviously this new party, the Pakistan Istakam Party, uh, is coming up. So when you review these mechanics, do you see the PTI retaining its vote bank should elections take place in November? If the election takes place and PTI is even allowed to run in those elections, I think that while the leadership, uh, the first year leadership or the second year leadership of the party, it has fallen like a, a you know, pack of cards. The, yes, we all know that. But the vote bank, I believe, has hardened. So there can be two possibilities. One, if the PTI is allowed, how to run so i mean will they find candidates in each and every constituency that is one that's uh, another major question and if they find it or, or uh, there's a scenario where they, there are no candidates for pti so well, what will the that vote bank will do uh, will it uh, vote for people's party or uh, ipp the istikam uh, whatever the new name istikam pakistan, pakistan party, party yes. or or noon league yeah. yeah so whom they are going to uh, vote for or will they uh, you know stay quiet uh, they won't vote. So, I mean, I have an apprehension if PTI is not allowed to run. The PTI hardened vote bank, they are not going to turn up, uh, especially in the urban areas among the educated people, uh, because people, uh, the PTI has mobilized a new kind of voters in the country. Those people who were apolitical uh, before the emergence of the PTI. So that, that comprises a solid vote bank. Then there is youth 
who uh, who are uh, who, who think that you know Imran Khan is the youngest, at least he's young at heart. So they, they are the ones. So they will be st standing disillusion. So I think that the hardened uh, uh, vote bank of PTI or the the committed vote bank of PTI, they are not going to turn up if the PTI is not allowed to run. And in case elections are held minus PTI, mm -hmm. so then there will be a question that uh, about the legitimacy of the whole electoral excise. Uh, right. th this is one big question. And for another four or five years, there's a question of instability because you are keeping a major chunk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, political power out of the uh, electoral system. So that will, that's again a very challenging situation for the country. Yes. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about, uh, do you see the possibility of Imran Khan being trialed um, under a military court? which obviously the military court system has become extremely controversial internationally. We've as seen assessments by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which considers the entire concept of military courts to be um, you know, inconsistent with basic human rights. Uh, in light of that, do you think that despite the pressure on not trialing him or not prosecuting him under uh, the military court, it still remains a possibility given the situation? I think I mean, uh, within the PDM and maybe within the establishment, there is a thinking that yes, Imran Khan should be tried uh, by a military court. Okay. Uh, but I mean, th this is going to create more problem for uh, because I mean, uh, whether Imran Khan is punished or acquitted, even the trial itself will become controversial. It will become one of the biggest story uh, of the world, a global story. If Imran Khan, uh, uh, you know, one-time national hero, a former prime minister, he's being tried under the military court, so it's not going to get uh, good marks for Pakistan. It's not good for the image of the country. Uh, because, yes, uh, we, we, we claim that we are a democratic country. We, we are a country which says that we respect human rights. There are, you know, media freedoms. This is all the narrative which the government and the state tries to build. Absolutely. So if you put a very popular leader, uh, you know, being tried under the military uh, court, so it's going to create a controversy. And the sympathy factor uh, will, of course, go to, uh, with, will be with Imran Khan. Uh, so, but uh, I would say that I, 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 there are serious apprehensions that there can be a big move to disqualify Imran Khan through a military court or through a regular court or put him in jail for a long period. And some of the charges against him, uh, they, they, they are quite, you know, comical. I mean, uh, if somebody is accusing Imran Khan, the former prime minister, as being a terrorist, the country which has suffered the burnt of terrorism for more than, you know, two decades uh, is straight. And we have seen, you know, thousands of people losing their lives, thousands of security forces being killed and martyred. So here you are talking about your, you want to try political activists and a politician under the same law, or you want to try him like that. So this is going to raise questions both within the country and abroad. So I think, I mean, I hope that sanity prevails. Because, I mean, let's look at the history. Yeah. <laughs> there have been three major, I mean, if you remember the Rahul Pindi Sadish case, the Rahul Pindi conspiracy case, 1951. Yes. yes. Right? I mean, if there was a move within the army to topple the, the then government of Liaquat Ali Khan. Yes. Where that uh, the trial occurred? The trial occurred under a civilian tribunal, right? Mm. Then there was a Hyderabad conspiracy case, mm. uh, which was against, uh, again, against, against the nationalist leaders. What happened at that time? And at that time, more than 4,000 our soldiers and officers were martyred during the British insurgency. Again, it was tried under the civilian court, civilian tribunal. Then again, we had the hijacking, famous hijacking case, uh, former army chief's uh, passenger plane was being diverted to India by former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Again, where that uh, you know uh, case was tried, it was tried by uh, under a civilian court. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. there is a uh, you know we have to make a distinction between a political activist, politician, with a with a terrorist. Uh, I mean, for two years the uh, uh, the parliament and those uh, you know people being tried under the military court. I was one of those people, one of those journalists who supported that idea. Because the terrorists, the black terrorists, black means the category where they place TTP, for example. That, yeah, exactly. So yeah. what they do is that they, they would pressurize the judge. They will threaten the witnesses, even the prosecution. So there was no way that they could be tried and, uh, you know, convicted by a normal court. So right. that was, they, it, it was a legitimate uh, cause at that time. Pakistan was fighting a, a war on terror. So there, every, every Pakistani supported it. Most of the Pakistani supported it. But now the situation is totally different. You cannot try political prisoners or political activists, but you know you can face them like uh, treat them like TTP or Al Qaeda. Yes, Hamza.
Right, absolutely. So when we talk about this, I mean, it seems to me, if you look at the political situation paving out, and we talk about military courts being an extremely important variable in this entire equation, it's almost as if Nawaz Sharif or the former prime minister was disqualified in the Panama Papers case. Uh, there is this, um, you know, the mechanics are built in a way that somehow he returns to Pakistan, has the right to appeal in front of the Supreme Court, while Imran Khan is delegitimized and disqualified and also labeled a terrorist. I mean, I've seen some, you mentioned the comical cases. There's something like 134 cases on him. And uh, some of the comical statements by his opposition is to equate him with maybe TTP commanders who would actually attack military installations in the country. But uh, do you see that this is more of a ploy by the PDM to try and give the soft corner for Nawaz Sharif to come back into the country while Imran Khan is actually taken out of uh, the political race? This is more political rather than, uh, you could say, legal, this entire uh, way of prosecuting Imran Khan? I mean, the scenario which you are stating is very obvious, and that's and, and things are heading in that direction. Right. But my question is that that uh, okay, if the PDM is able to implement its grand plan and the the, the revival of uh, Sharif family politics and their dynasty, the question is, I mean, uh, how Pakistanis are going to take it? Maybe right. I mean through uh, by hook and crook, you, you you manage to you know push all these that that agenda forward. But again, what has happened that? Our parliament during the last 14 months, whatever lawmaking they have done, they have done it for all the laws they've made are person specific, including the latest law, where it seems that our parliament is working as a facilitator of the corrupt people of the convicts or those people who stand accused of corruption. Right. Rather than thinking ways how to get them convicted, they are trying to find ways how to get them acquitted. Right. Or if they have been already irritated them to get out of that, uh, you know, the grasp of the uh, law. So, I mean, it is very comical, it's very ironic, because, I mean, there has been no lawmaking in Pakistan during the last 14 months, which is for pro-people, for, for the workers, for the peasants, for journalists, for the students. No, there's for middle class, working class. There's been no no single lawmaking. They, they changed the NAB laws that was to facilitate the corrupt or, or, or those people who, who stand accused of massive corruption. Right. And uh, again, uh, the, the laws in the uh, what you, the judicial laws, they tried to change again. They were uh, to dilute or to, 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 to what you say, the blend the bite of the judiciary. Uh, and again, the third law, which is, you know, uh, through which they want no actually back and yeah. they are going the right you know, to appeal. In the past. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're giving him the right to appeal. So yeah. already that case stands close. He has appealed and that appeal has been rejected. He's been right. a, he's a convict. So, I mean, that's what they are doing. So they are making a farce of the entire legal system of Pakistan. You know, there's a one set of laws for the privileged few, for the 0.00001% Pakistanis. Because NAB laws are not my problem. They are not the problem of the ordinary Pakistan. Of course. So is these laws, which, which they have just framed for, uh, to help Nawaz Sharif or Jangir Tari. So, I mean, it, I mean it, it is a mockery of constitution. It is a mockery of, of, of legal system of Pakistan. So may God help us. I mean, I can only say that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, speaking specifically about, I mean, I, I can go back into retrospect. And we could say that the moment the PDM government came into power, they tried to pass laws that could actually, um, you know, clip the powers of the National Accountability Bureau and their ability to actually prosecute them. But uh, don't you feel it's ironic that the very same National Accountability Bureau is trying to, you could say, hunt down Imran Khan, particularly in the case of his recent arrest, because he was in the premises of the, of the court. He was actually appearing before the court. And then the Supreme Court ruled that any, uh, you could say, arrest within the premises of the court of law is considered to be illegal and uh, unconstitutional. But then, Mr. Ahmed, the hue and cry that came from the opposition that the Supreme Court is actually favoring Imran Khan, do you think there are any merits to that argument? Or, uh, again, it's, it's just another political statement? I would say that it is another political statement because, I mean, there's only one institution which was standing against this, all the mechanic or mechanization, what they were doing, trying to, you know, change the constitution or not implement the constitution. They, I mean, PDM, while saying that they, they abide by the constitution, they were working against the spirit of the constitution. The constitution is very clear that once the provincial assembly or any assembly gets dissolved, the election must be held within 90 days. Yeah. So, I mean, here we see that the basic parameters of constitution were not being implemented. And it is not the way Imran Khan alone was arrested. I mean, yes, uh, arresting anyone from the court premises is, is, is a questionable thing. But, I mean, but the way he was pushed, the way he was, you know, shown by, by the security personnel, 
and even I mean, was there a need to break the glasses? And no. I mean, the, the way he was, after all, former prime minister. I right. mean, you could have. I mean, we have seen arrests. I mean, during my thirty years of career, more than thirty years of career, huh? career, I've seen many arrests for, of politicians. The police goes or the security personnel go and they'll say, "Come, sir, come with us." They will allow him to, you know, pack his suitcase or attach and then in they a will dignified take him to manner. Yeah, in a dignified manner. But here, what is happening? The brave Punjab police of Pakistan, wherever they go for a, a you know, uh, conduct a raid or arrest a person, what they do? They break and smash the glasses of the vehicles. They break the furniture. They break the TV sets. I mean, I mean, why? I mean, they could. I mean, of course, we are not saying we are not defending the corrupt people. If I mean, they, they stand accused of corruption or for any other uh, any other illegal uh, action. They should be arrested, but there's a way to arrest people. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot start threatening uh, women. You cannot start beating children. You cannot start, you know, uh, you know, terrorizing the entire neighborhood and, and the entire family. And that's what they've done. And this is being done. And now there are footages of each and every arrest. I mean, you go, I mean, it seems that every house where the brave Punjab police has entered, they have just ransacked it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's footage on Twitter, there's footage on Facebook, there's footage yeah. everywhere. And, uh, you know, the way women have been treated has, is absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's a travesty for justice because, frankly speaking, the dignity of the household and the dignity of the person is being brazenly violated uh, under the caretaker chief minister, Mohsin Nakhwe. True. But because, I mean, and th that has also made the, the, the role of the caretaker government questionable. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, yes, there were apprehensions that this caretaker government is not neutral. And they proved by their action that they are not neutral. I mean, if, if, if doubts are raised about a person, he should try to act in moderation. He should uh, try to act under the law, under the by, abide by the constitution. But here we see an unelected person, the way he's using the administration and the police, and the question, and then there's a questionable role of the police itself. I mean, why they are, you know, abiding by uh, those illegal uh, orders? So, I mean, we say that yes, arrest. If somebody has committed a crime, please go ahead and arrest him. But you know, treat him with uh, in in a, in a dignified manner. And we are not saying that you know that you start, you throw them in prison, and the, you people keep searching for the arrested person for days and weeks. I mean, still you know that I mean, the journalists who are missing. Yes, the people who are I mean, Imran Riaz's case is just, uh, I mean, exactly. I, I was about this, to mention that. Imran yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating in a way that we, you just cannot locate where he is. I mean, we, we knew for a yeah. fact that, you know, Arshad Sharif eventually ended up in Kenya. And, uh, you know, the entire, I mean, I would argue, and maybe you would endorse this, that this entire, uh, the mechanics of it was, you know, built in Pakistan before he actually went to Kenya. But if you take a look at where Imran Riaz is, I mean, most of the courts have even said that we don't know his whereabouts. So this is just this is exactly. just exactly everybody is disowning his arrest. And the second thing is that I mean, against journalists, you can have two cases: defamation and libel case. And you can take them to high court, supreme court, trials. But there's no harm in it. I mean, uh, journalists should be open for that. If if I report, if I misreport something, if I if I make false allegations, yes. The victim has all the right to take me Absolutely. to the court. Yeah. So, I mean, Imran Riyadh, if he has, you know, hurt the feelings of someone, he has misquoted anything, please take him to the court. But at least take him to the court. I mean, that's what we are saying. Yeah, but he's not in the court, is he? I mean, he. it's almost as if he's in, exactly. this, you know, isolated cell somewhere. I mean, uh, just just to put in a humorous tinge to this, maybe in somewhere in, in the isolated district of Balochistan, we don't know where he is. And that raises questions about the credibility of the justice system in this country. Exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, it has always been controversial in Pakistan. But I think in, during the last 14 months, I've been really fatal. Uh, I, I don't think so uh, that, I mean, ever, ever before, I don't remember, even during Parvez Musharraf period, it was a military mm -hmm. government. Yeah. And um, uh, there was a movement by the journalists, but I mean, they were not treated like that. Yes, they were arrested. They were thrown into a, you know, lockup in 2007. I'm talking about 2007 uh, and 8. Uh, but I mean, this, people knew that what's happening. And I think this government, I mean, the way it is, it is operating, it, it is the most brutal in my living memory. I have never seen it like this. And I see a continuation of the PMLN policies uh -huh. because what we believe, when uh, he was in power for the second time, that was in '98. Well, uh, you, if you remember, you can uh, you know talk to seniors that a journalist like Najam Sethi was now in the PMLN camp. Yeah. He was arrested. He was kidnapped. Uh, I mean, there was a demand from the big publishing houses to sack editors. Uh, the biggest group at that time, Jung, the Jung group, 
they were publishing the news and junk uh, newspaper on two pages. That I'm talking about 98, 99. Yeah, 98. And there right. was a long list that 98 that they wanted Malia Lodi to be sacked and some other journalists to be sacked from the junk group. And for that, they went, you know, uh, they resorted to high handed action. <clears throat> In 2015, again, there was a new group was being launched, Bold Media Group. Again, it was targeted. Yes. And the yes. bait was closed uh, using the pretext of a, uh, of, of a New York Times quote. Again, it was a questionable thing because without proving the guilt, you cannot punish and close a, a business, a legitimate business. But that's what they've done. And now, again, the third time. I mean, look, I mean, the way Archer Chari was threatened and finally he was martyred he, under very mysterious circumstances. In Pakistan, the, I mean, imagine a person like Archer Chari had to flee the country. Uh, I mean, Archer Chari was our poster boy of the fifth generation war. He, you know, he was... He was like an excellent investigative journalist as well. I mean, he, he was, was an excellent great investigative, investigative journalist. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great investigative journalist. So if it could happen to Archer Chari, and he was a high-profile journalist. Yes. Right. So, uh, and, and then there are many others, I mean, who have been silenced, who are very cautious, I mean, how to speak, what to write, what not to write. So things have changed. Rather than, you know, ensuring a, a freedom of press, get forward. We are going on a backward direction. Right, right. It's yes. very unfortunate. So I, I was just coming across uh, the ISPR statement uh, just recently. I mean, it just came about 15 to 20 minutes ago where they basically categorically stated that any attack on the military installation would not be tolerated and the army would take all the steps necessary to try and make sure that any political party, political actor, or political activist involved would be prosecuted. So if we talk about um, the status of the military establishment, I mean, there's a lot of talk about its neutrality and its uh, uh, lack of meddling in political affairs. Uh, do you think that really is the case based on your own analysis? Because most journalists would claim that, yes, they are neutral. Most would claim that they're not neutral. So what is your take on that? So first of all, we have to, uh, you know, realize that in any developing country, establishment always has a role. So I'm I'm one of those people, uh, who, I mean, uh, I mean, there's a very uh, lopsided discussion that's about civilian supremacy. And we know that civilian institutions are weak over here. Yeah. So, I mean, people like me always say that our military leadership and the civilian leadership, they have to work in tandem and support one another. That is the best possible scenario for Pakistan, uh, where uh, are both the civilian and military leadership, they are pushing the country in the same, same direction. That is the you know, uh, way forward for the country right now. Uh, and, and of course, because there's a historical baggage for Pakistan, where military leadership or the institution of the military, they have more power. Uh, I mean, when... Uh, at the time of partition, we inherited a bigger military and a smaller uh, financial base. I mean, it's yes. all documented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So from the day one, it was lopsided, right? And again, if, uh, we wanted to run our uh, democracy in a country which was, uh, you know, feudal, tribal, right? And where the middle class was very small and the industrial revolution was nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th that's why we had a flawed democracy. And th that's why the military kept interfering because our political parties and institutions were weak. And it is very wrong to compare that, you know, Pakistan and India, they both vote on freedom in the same year, the same date. But the problem is that uh, India comprised the more advanced, uh, you, know, you know, parts of British India, while Pakistan comprised the backward parts of British India. We only had one city, that was Lahore. Yes. Right? Karachi was a small, a small, a small town. Uh, Bengal, East, East Bengal, East Pakistan without Calcutta was a ruler slum. So, I mean, so there was no grand, grand basis for, you know, to establish democracy over here. So that's why India had a head start because all the institutions were there. The parliament was there. Even the political party Congress, it was there. Here, the, uh, you know, Muslim League had to be, you know, uh, repositioned from yeah. minority provinces to the majority provinces. Yeah, that's a good so point. The evolution yeah. is totally different. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so the evolution is very different. So I'm not one of those who say that, you know, that it's sort of a conspiracy of the military that they interfered. It was, there were some objective conditions. There were mistakes committed by the civilian leadership. They were, so that's why we see where we are now. So going forward, I mean, the, the unfortunate part is that institutions like military, they should not be made controversial. And here, the, every political party has done its bit to make them controversial. And we want, uh, you know, every political pair want military on their side, whether it's People's Party, PTI, uh, Nuku, PMLN, yeah. you know, Nawaz League, PMLN, you name any political party, they all want uh, military support. So military then has, uh, you know, the choices to make. Yeah. So let's accept that those factors. So, I mean, PTI, I, I think uh, Imran, who had been, you know, part of the power matrix of Pakistan, 
or the PTI itself, they should know the limits, you know, how to deal. I mean, to open which front is important and which front is not important, unimportant. So uh, maybe, I mean, uh, they, 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 they might have grievances with the army, but I mean, the way they tried to pull them in, in this political tussle, so it has went against them. Just imagine till May 8th, PTI was seen unconquerable, was, un, you know, it, it was flying high. But and the, poll, the polls suggest that it was and, like a, a rocketing 70%, exactly. 75%. Yeah. And, and, and believe me, I mean, whether one, one supports PTI or one opposes PTI, one has to accept that after 9th May, there couldn't be business as usual on part of the establishment. Yeah. I mean, that was there. I mean, they were pushed in that direction. I mean, rather if they had hold, you know, held those discussion, uh, those demonstration outside Jati Umrah or some, you know, Punjab Assembly or Governor House, that would have made more sense. So I would say that PTI overplayed its card. So it created problem for itself. And, and, and I would say I'm one of those uh, uh, persons who say that PTI is not anti-establishment in its DNA. PTI is the most pro-establishment political party we have. Yeah, they have a history of that, right? They have a history of that. It is in their DNA. I mean, now their workers and their supporters are acting like jilted lovers. Right? I mean, th th that is kind of, uh, I would say, the division between them. Yes, we know about the People's Party. Yes, they have a strong history of being anti-establishment. The Sharif has a strong anti-establishment. He came in power thrice. All the three times he had differences with the military leadership. And that's why he was ousted. Mm -hmm. So so here, the, here we have PTI. Because still we have to know, I mean, what grand sin or crime Imran Khan committed that he was ousted like this. I mean, about Nawaz Sharif, there was a you know, total narrative was built that, you know, he was pro Moody once and, you know, all sort of charges. I'm not going to... 2015, yes, absolutely. I mean, he, he undermined the Kashmir cause. Yeah. He undermined the Kashmir cause. I mean, these were the stories which were being shared with the media, that he undermined the Kashmir there cause. There was another story which was very interesting, by the way. It was, uh, you know, this... this <clears> by, it was actually accused. It was an accusation by the PTI which suggested that Nawaz Sharif was going ahead with um, sedition by claiming that the Pakistan judicial system did not prosecute, um, you know, the perpetrators of the Mumbai attacks, which is very interesting because he was not necessarily backing the own judicial system. And he says that, well, there's no humanity in Pakistan. They should have handed over the perpetrators to India. So, I mean, when you talk about that, that does amount to sedition charges if you uh, take it from, you know, the basic definition of what that constitutes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, here we have to know, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, appointing Buzdar was a bone of contention, we all know. But I mean, that is a political issue. I mean, it is not, I, I can't say that it becomes a core core issue for, for you know, of differences. So, we have to yet know the detail. At least I don't know those details. Because I'm sitting in Karachi. That no. was, I mean, what was the last straw which bro broke the, you know, camel's back? So, we have to know about that. But saying that, I mean, I would say that PTI is still, I would say it's the post-establishment political party and establishment should not try to, you know, uh, maybe the, the people in the government, they want PTI and the, there should be a full-blown escalation between a popular political force. Yeah, a confrontation. Countries, most political political force and the most organized and different institution that they should be pitted once in, uh, against each other. That is not a good scenario. As a Pakistani, I feel sad about it. Because, yeah. I mean, uh, no political party, not just PTI, no political party should be standing against the army and the army should not be seen standing against any other political party. So, uh, army has a very important role to play in, in, in our scheme of things and they should continue doing that. And, uh, you know, uh, trying to civilize the country, trying to end the political uncertainty, even they are trying to help our economy now. So, all these things are good. But at the same time, those political tensions, they need to be lowered now. The politics of you know confrontation and the uncertainty that needs to be changed. But I mean, may, maybe six months down the road, or it can drag on for another one year or so. But eventually, it will come down. Okay. Sense will prevail, inshallah. Hopefully, inshallah. So, Mr. Amazel, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Same here. Thank you. All right. So that's all that we have for now on Think Tech Hawaii. This is Islamabad today. I was your host, Hamza Rafiq Hussain. You can follow us on our social media pages and do give us your feedback. Till next time, take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, 
and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.